Okay, welcome everyone to this meeting of the JDD. Um, today we're joined by Raphael Fazel uh, from Cambridge, who's here to talk to us about whether or not there's a correct way to do. So, thank you very much, Raphael, for coming. Thanks a lot. And thank you all very much for coming today to discuss my paper, Is There a Correct Way to Do Legal Theory? A Response to Chewy Dixon. I'm particularly grateful to Crescente, Hafstein, and Josh for inviting me today to present my paper at the JDG. Uh, you should all have received the handout, um, I hope. Um, there might be some spare, otherwise, if you could share it, that'd be great. Now, I discussed the question, is there a correct way to do legal theory in my paper? Um, and that question raises another one, namely how we can identify what is and what is not a correct way to do legal theory. My paper is a contribution in meta-jurisprudence, or um, jurisprudential methodology as it's sometimes called. Um, and it is therefore primarily interested not so much in whether there is a correct legal theory, but in whether there is a correct way to do legal theory. Although I'm sure as uh, the ones of you who've read the paper, and as I will explain in the presentation, I take the two questions actually be to, write, re to be related in some extent at least. The paper is a response to Julie Dixon's argument, um, which I will elaborate um, in a minute, um, which he calls the indirectly evaluative uh, legal theory, or IELT. And she claims that um, IELT is, and I quote, the correct methodological approach for a theory of law to adopt. And she makes that um, claim in her evaluation of legal theory, and now in a, uh, in a new monograph she's working on at the moment. And I call this claim the claim uh, of the correctness thesis, and I will test it in my paper whether or not it is actually correct that IOT is the correct way to do legal theory. Now following Dixon, my focus in the paper um, is on the question of evaluation in legal theory. There's more questions that are being discussed in jurisprudential methodology to be sure, but I take this one to be a particularly interesting one for two reasons. Uh, first, it is closely connected to the long-standing debate among legal positivists and natural lawyers about the relationship between law and morality, and it touches on uh, that debate to some extent, so that's one reason why it's an interesting uh, topic. Another one being uh, the fact that I think it can serve as a litmus test for the more general question what the limitations and the potential for jurisprudential uh, methodological inquiry is. My argument in a nutshell that I'll be presenting uh, today is firstly that I think Dixon's points that she's adducing to support the correctness thesis as they stand are insufficient to actually prove that thesis. And second, whether or not IELT is at least a correct way to do legal theory rather than the correct way to do legal theory cannot be answered independently of one's substantive account of law. Now, to set the context for my argument and my analysis of Dixon's work, um, we can start here with section one and the fact that there is actually a consensus on um, the fact that description enough is not considered to be sufficient to do adequate or correct legal theory. Um, most authors seem to agree that we need to engage in at least some forms of evaluation. But opinions differ on what kinds of evaluations we need to be successful legal theorists. And I built here on Dixon to distinguish between three different types of evaluations. And I'm not necessarily committed to this distinction, but I accept it for the sake of testing uh, the correctness thesis. The first kind of evaluation is um, what I call here epistemic evaluation. And it relates to what uh, Dixon calls meta-theoretical values, um, such as simplicity, simplicity, clarity, elegance, comprehensiveness, or coherence. And she argues that really, um, these epistemic evaluations are so banal, and it's also a term that Brian Leiter uses that. If that's all that successful legal theorizing needs, then we might as well say that it's relatively value free. It's very basic as it were. But then some go further than that and say that successful legal theory requires um, a higher degree of evaluation, um, if you will. And that's the second one here that I call substantive, or Dixon calls it indirect evaluation. And it's a point that um, people brought up in response to um, John Finnis's first chapter in Natural Law and Natural Rights and his finding that, well, law does not come neatly demarcated from other social practices 
Um, it is, as he calls it, a vast rubbish heap of miscellaneous facts. And as legal theorists, we have to identify which of these facts are more important than others in order to present um, an adequate theory of law. So as a result, then, we need um, some higher degree of evaluation, substantive evaluation. And the way Dixon quotes it here is that she says, legal theorists must also be sensitive to or take adequate account of what is regarded as important and significant by those whose beliefs, attitudes, behavior, etc., are under consideration. And here she uh, makes reference to the idea that law is a hermeneutic concept, one that we use to understand ourselves. Then some go even further than that and argue that um, to do correct legal theory, uh, we also need to engage in moral, or Dixon calls it direct, um, evaluation. So not only do we need epistemic and substantive evaluation, we also need moral evaluation. Uh, one example that Dixon discusses in this context is Dworkin. I'm going to say uh, more about Dworkin in a few minutes. Uh, but essentially Dworkin argues that law is an interpretive concept that can only be understood if we engage in constructive interpretation. And that enterprise requires us to determine what the point of our constructive interpretations are. And for Dworkin, that point is a moral one. It is the fact that um, law serves as a constraint on governmental power. And therefore, we require moral evaluation as legal theorists. Finnis is another example that Dixon discusses in this context. Um, and his point that the well, law is here to help us realize the common good. Um, Law can only be understood from a practical point of view, and that practical point of view is one that regards law as a moral ideal. And in other words, then the viewpoint, and that's a quote here that I have on, on the handout, the viewpoint that can best account for the central case of law is one that involves moral evaluation. Now what's Dixon's <coughs> argument then exactly? Her argument of IELT is the um, a, an approach, as she defines it here, to legal theory which seeks to pick out and explain the important and significant features of law without prejudging the issue of whether or not they render law a good or justified phenomenon. So in other words, what she says is we need evaluation of type 1 and 2, epistemic and substantive, but we don't require moral evaluation to do correct legal theory or successful legal theory. And she illustrates this with an example of what she calls an agnostic observer who tries to um, present an account of what a Catholic mass is, or a well-celebrated Catholic mass. And she says that the agnostic observer will have to sit in, observe what's going on, um, but not only will she have to make or present a theory in the end that is clear, comprehensive in the epistemic sense, but she will also need to identify features in that mass that are important to present an adequate account. So I give the example of the breaking of the bread, for example, will probably stand out as an important feature from the perspective of the ones that are engaged in that uh, practice of the, the mass. Whereas perhaps if people come in late all the time, perhaps that's not identified as an important feature. Dixon's point here is that we will need these substantive evaluations, um, but the observer will not have to actually um, make a judgment on whether the breaking of the bread is also morally good or bad in the moral or third sense here, the direct sense as, he call, as she calls it. Right, to support her thesis then that IOT <coughs> is the correct methodological approach, um, Dixon adduces a range of ways in which we can establish, um, in the same way as the agnostic observer would, important or significant features about law without drawing on moral evaluations. She does acknowledge at first that the proposition that some x, that's the quote you have here, is significant and important to explain, can be supported or justified by a directly or morally evaluative proposition because it is morally good, for example, a morally good feature. But she says that it is not the case that indirectly evaluative uh, propositions can only be supported in this way. And what she does, and, and the, the sort of a, a, a to D points that I have here in my handout, are ways in which Dixon suggests we can identify these important features about law <coughs> as legal theorists without having to engage in moral um, evaluation. Now I should say that in addressing these points, I use Dworkin as a sort of interlocutor, not so much because I agree with Dworkin 
but because I want to show that um, Dixon's points are based on certain substantive assumptions about law, which are at odds with the assumptions that, um, that Dworkin would make, and which therefore question her claim that um, uh, this proves the correctness of IELT and that no other sort of uh, stances could be taken on these points. But let's go through them together now to see what I mean. The first way in which she thinks that we can establish the importance of uh, a feature as legal theorist is, for example, by the fact that that feature um, is one that law invariably exhibits and which hence reveals the distinctive mode of law's operation. Dixon uses Raz's theory of law here as an illustration. She says that law's claim to moral authority is something which law invariably does and which is hence characteristic of it. And to pick out that feature of law making a claim to moral authority rather than being actually morally authoritative um, is something we don't need moral evaluations for. Substantive evaluations will be sufficient and therefore um, seemingly supporting her point in favour of IELT. Now, in the paper, I address some problems with this um, claim. First, I think invariability <coughs> is not sufficient to establish that a feature is important. Um, I give the example of the existence of gavels and men in ropes wherever there is law, most likely. But we wouldn't take the fact that there are gavels and men in ropes to be an important feature about law, simply because they are invariably present wherever there is law. Further, um, law's distinctive mode of operation, so that's a comeback that Dixon could have here, she could say it's not only invariably something that law must have, but it should also be revealing of its distinctive mode of uh, operation, as the quote says here. But I think that um, law does not self-evidently present itself um, as making a claim to moral authority. Rather, it could simply be seen, as I argue in the paper, as imposing and executing threats. Or, its distinctive mode of operation uh, could be seen in its being actually morally legitimate in that it justifies and constrains governmental power in the Dworkinian sense. And if this were the case, then of course you would again need moral evaluation uh, to pick that feature out. So essentially then what this point here struggles with, I think, is to show how someone who adopts a different starting point, a different uh, substantive theory about law, such as Dworkin, <coughs> and would not think that um, substantive evaluation here is sufficient to pick out um, a distinctive mode of law's operation in the way Dixon um, would uh, like it to be. Then second, another way is um, to establish uh, the importance of a feature is by the prevalence and the consequences of certain beliefs on the part of those subject to law concerning that feature, indicating its centrality to our self-understanding. So again, that goes to the idea of law being a hermeneutic concept. Now Dixon again illustrates this with uh, Raz's uh, substantive theory of law, and she points out at least some people who live under law, the officials especially, um, will accept the law's claim to moral authority and will behave accordingly. That, that's something we can see in the prevalence and consequences of their beliefs, as it were. But again, I'm not sure if sort of <coughs> things are as um, granular as she makes it seem, and that this is really the only thing that we would uh, be able to pick out. It seems to me that the Dworkinian um, will be more likely to take people's beliefs to point in the direction of law's purpose as a constraint of governmental power, again requiring moral evaluation as a result, and substantive evaluation would be insufficient. So again, I'm not sure if um, this point here is sufficiently clear to show us that um, it can only point in the sort of substantive evaluation direction which she would like it to. Um. Then C, um, another way we can pick out an important feature, according to Dixon, without drawing on moral evaluation, is by the fact that that feature in question bears upon matters of practical concern to us. And again, she illustrates that by drawing on RAS, um, by saying that the fact that law subjects us to its claim authority is of practical concern to us. And the point that I tried to make in the paper, um, and obviously I only broach it here, is that Again, it seems to me that a legal theorist could just as well infer from the way people uh, conduct their lives that they only regard as legal um, the kinds of decisions that are actually morally authoritative rather than um, the ones that simply make a claim to it, say. Then finally, she proposes that there's a, a yet another element uh, or a way in which we can establish uh, what is important um, about law. And it is by the way in which a specific feature 
is relevant to or has a bearing upon various directly evaluative questions, more evaluative ones, concerning whether it and the social institution which it exhibits are good or bad things. So the argument here is one where uh, she says that substantive evaluation is, um, or that only when substantive evaluation was successful at pointing out what is important, can we then move on um, to the question whether or not that thing is actually a morally um, important one. It's really a point that goes back to uh, Hart and uh, even Bentham that we first need to be able to describe the very thing <coughs> and that we then want to move on to morally assess, right? So in a sense she says then that ILT is a necessary first step on the way to evaluating the law morally. I mean the paper I address two problems with that but here I want to focus on the main one. It just seems to me that the argument is circular in that it assumes that a legal theorist can lay bare what is important and significant uh, about the feature of law without engaging in moral evaluation. But on Workin's account, law does not exist independently of its interpretation. And as we saw, the constructive interpretation of law would um, require moral evaluation. So to think that there is this thing out there that we can simply describe at first or evaluate in a substantive sense and then move on um, to evaluate morally, I think begs the question here, Dworkin would disagree with that. As a result, then, I think Dixon's points uh, that I've just um, sort of uh, discussed only establish that a theorist who adopts a substantive account of law, which is already in tune with IELT, such as uh, Raz's substantive account of law, can identify features as important without needing to resort to moral evaluation. Those who like Dworkin adopt the first order account according to which law is actually morally authoritative will need to engage in moral evaluation to identify the important features. Now, in fact, Dixon acknowledges in her book um, <coughs> that different theorists will have different starting points, and she acknowledges that Raz and Dworkin really uh, disagree here on their, their different starting points. And she does acknowledge that, well, yes, for Dworkin, perhaps a moral criteria might be an essential, an essential part of what a successful uh, legal theory is. But she still goes on to argue that ILT is preferable to Dworkin's method because the latter, as she says, closes down many of the most important questions which can be asked within jurisprudence before they can properly be raised. And among these questions um, are, as Dixon suggests, well, whether law has a point or function at all, something that Dworkin um, sort of presupposes, and whether that point means that law is necessarily morally meritorious, um, uh, phenomenon, whether it's morally justified. <coughs> Again, she thinks these are very interesting questions that um, if we adopt Dworkin's method, um, we could not see as part of legal theory, we could not even um, try to answer. And even if we agree with her that these are interesting questions, I'm, I don't think the argument actually works. It seems to be question begging because on Dworkin's approach, these are not questions that form part of the remit of legal theory in the first place. So to criticize him for that, um, might be to criticize him, criticize him for, um, for closing debate on, uh, say, um, or to make an argument, perhaps, as I suggest in the paper, about it being aesthetically interesting to be able to discuss more rather than fewer points, but I don't think it is one that she could use to establish the correctness of IELT because it does propose, um, again, a substantive theory of law. And that would render it true that these are questions that we can address in the first place. As a result, then, I think Dixon's points, as they stand at least, they prove to fail the correctness thesis. Now, I mentioned in the paper that she might have other ways of showing how we can identify important features without um, a drawing on moral evaluation, but at least as it stands, I think that um, she needs to um, provide uh, more arguments in favour of the correctness thesis. Her assumptions, as I think I've shown, uh, stack the cards against those who, like Dworkin, adopt a different starting point that is a starting point that adopts a different substantive view about law. Having established then um, that ILT may not be the correct way <coughs> to do legal theory, the paper moves on to its last section, um, which addresses the question whether ILT might at least be A, that is, one among potentially other correct ways of doing jurisprudence. And this part raises the broader question as to what the conditions, the general conditions are 
for a correct methodological inquiry into law. Now to address this point, I, um, I discuss what I call the straightforward response to this question. And the straightforward response goes as follows. It says that legal theorists are pretty much like natural scientists. Both study an independent scientific object, an explanandum, if you will, um, that, um, again, exists independently of their theories, and they report their conclusions in a theory, the explanans. As a result, the correct way to do legal theory on this straightforward response is simply one that does a great job at you know, reporting the conclusions about an independent scientific object. <coughs> I try to point out the problems with this um, uh, response, um, and they are the following, I think. The natural scientists' object of study are natural kinds which do exist independently of human beings, and I give the example of the helium atom. Human activity plays no role in the existence or properties of the helium atom, such as the fact that it invariably has two electrons. Law, by contrast, is a social kind, a hermeneutic concept, as we saw, which consists of and is constituted by human practices and practices of how we understand ourselves. I then address two replies that the proponent of the straightforward response could give um, to my point. The first one is that, well, while um, law might not be uh, a natural kind of in the independent in the way uh, the, like the helium atom might be, it is still made up of common practices that are, in, that are independent of the individual legal theorists. Um, they are out there, as it were, for us to study and um, to report our, uh, the results of our studies. And secondly, as such, we could perhaps also say that law has essential universal properties, um, much in the same way as the helium atom has with its two electrons. The paper then moves on to uh, rebut these replies. Against the first reply, I think the problem that we have to point out is that the common practices, again, point going back to Finnis, um, do not come demarcated from other practices, and we have to evaluate um, um, which ones are the legal practices. And legal theorists will pick out and identify as legal practices um, what or sorry, what they will pick out is not independent uh, from their first order accounts of what law is. In the same way as the helium atom is independent from the theories of the natural scientists. And in addition, I argue in the paper that legal theorists not only identify certain practices as law rather than other practices, but to the extent that their theories are successful and gain influence, they can become self-verifying, as Ras puts it, in that people will start to understand law in the way that the legal theorists propose. Or at least I guess that's um, the dream of <laughs> every legal theorist. It's a two-way street, as I, that's the term I use in the paper to describe this relationship. And against the second reply, um, I draw on Frederick Schauer to sort of cast some critical light on Raz's idea that law might have universal essential properties. Schauer suggests that if law is a social kind, then like other social kinds, um, it might be better described as what he calls a cluster-like concept, or maybe something like a family resemblance concept in Wittgenstein's sense. Now, I'm not very committed um, to that particular point of view, but I think what is essential is um, there are problems with the idea that there are universal features that law has in the same way as the helium atom has universal features. Um, in particular, I think once we adopt this approach, um, we will come up with a stipulative um, definition, really, of what law is. It will have a short shelf life, or as Raz says, it has built-in obsolescence, in the sense that we will have a sort of freeze-frame idea of that is law, these are the essential features. But the problem is that, in so doing, we give up on the project of tracking the fluctuating common practices that underlying are supposed to make up law. The upshot then of my analysis is that the straightforward response fails. Uh, whether there is indeed the correct way to do legal theory and whether ILT is the correct methodological approach depends on at least f two factors of substantive theorizing about law. It depends firstly on the practices that a legal theorist picks out as the common practices that constitute law. Different legal theorists make different evaluative judgments as we saw. 
And as a result, there will be different conceptions of law and different ways of doing legal theory that color correspond to these conceptions of law. And this may lead to a plurality of correct ways to do legal theory. Secondly, it will depend on the extent to which legal theory itself influences common practices. That was my point that with increasing popularity, a legal <coughs> theory can make its own luck, as it were, uh, shaping the practices of law in such a way as to make it the correct legal theory in the society that, adop that adopts these practices. Now, interestingly, um, Dixon acknowledges um, toward the end of her book, as well as in the introduction, that um, there may be something to what she calls the holistic uh, view, which is very similar to the one that I'm defending in this paper, uh, according to which, as she puts it, one cannot come to any important conclusions about correct jurisprudential methodology without delving deep into and attempting to come to the correct conclusions about the nature of law itself, um, the substantive uh, theories of law, as it were. Nevertheless, she suggests that there are questions which are distinctively methodological and can be answered independently of substantive theories about law. These are essentially the questions that she raises in the book and that I've tried to um, say something about here. But so I think that in light of the results of my paper, um, in making this claim, Dixon might be underestimating the extent to which identifying a correct way to do legal theory is inherently connected to one's substantive views about law. To conclude then, as things stand, and again I want to emphasize that there may be answers um, that Dixon can give to support the correctness thesis, but as things stand, um, I hope I have shown that her arguments are not yet sufficient to prove the correctness thesis. And as I've shown whether or not IELT is at least a correct way to do legal theory rather than the correct way to do legal theory, is more difficult to answer than the straightforward response suggested. While the common practices that make up law are at least partly independent of legal theories, they're always at the same time also dependent to the, uh, on them to some extent. And as a result then, whatever, uh, whether a particular methodology such as IELT is a correct way to do legal theory cannot be answered independently of one's underlying account of law. Now finally I should note that the purpose of my paper was not to undermine uh, Dixon's methodological approach. Um, I take it as an extremely valuable contribution um, to the field that has raised lots of very interesting questions. So rather I wanted to take up her invitation, which she makes in her book, that others join in and carry on the conversation, as she puts it, on matters methodological. And the paper has tried to do so in the collegial and constructive spirit of Dixon's own work, uh, which I very much admire. And with that, I have arrived at the end of my presentation, and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.